Hello, you're watching Entertainment Week. Coming up on the show, the queen of crime fiction, Patricia Cornwell, joins us in the studio to talk about her latest thriller. Urban artist Reg32 tells us why British rap gets a bad rep. We speak to the stars of The Hunger Games about approaching the end of the blockbuster saga. And... We'll be giving our verdict on all the big movie releases in our film review. Well, this week, further allegations about Bill Cosby led the American TV network NBC to cancel an upcoming project with a comedian. Several women have accused the former Cosby Show star of sexual assaults going back almost 30 years, but he's never been charged and refuses to comment. Well, Sky's Rihanna Mills is here with us now. Take us through, Rihanna, the, the history of these allegations. Yeah, well, anyone who loved their American sitcoms back in the 80s will know Bill Cosby very well, obviously, from the, the Cosby show. But now the 77-year-old is facing a number of allegations which are coming from around 15 women, we understand, uh, allegations of sexual assault and rape. Now, it's worth noting that back in 2006, a case was settled in the civil courts over an alleged incident that happened in 2004, but Bill Cosby has never been arrested, he's never been charged over any of these allegations, and he's also, through his agent, always denied all of these claims. Now, he's also refused to speak publicly about them. However, one journalist did try and ask him uh, about these allegations, and this is what he had to say. There is no comment about that. Okay. And, and I'll tell you why. I think you were told, I, I don't want to compromise your integrity, but um, we don't, I don't talk about it. Yeah. Now, can I get something from you What's that? that none of that will be shown? So what sort of impact is all this actually having on his TV work, Rihanna? Well, that was quite awkward viewing, mm. but you could see that he, he didn't want to talk publicly. He didn't want that interview uh, to be aired. Um, we may not have seen much of Bill Cosby recently, but it does seem clear that he's been trying to make a bit of a comeback. We know that uh, NBC and Netflix had projects in the pipeline that they were talking to him about and, and potentially uh, moving up to, to producing those. But for the moment, those have been postponed. We also know... We may not have heard of it here, but there's an American network called TV Land, and all references of his shows have now been uh, removed from that. Um, but despite that, uh, despite the fact that he doesn't seem to want to talk publicly about it, we do understand that he is doing a stand-up show at the moment. He's recently uh, performed in the Bahamas. He's also set to perform in the likes of Florida and Las Vegas. So it does seem that he's trying to push ahead business as usual. OK, Rihanna, thank you. Now it's time to catch up on the rest of the week's entertainment news. There is some flash photography coming up. The Academy Award-winning director of The Graduate, Mike Nichols, has died at the age of 83. The filmmaker, who was married to US News anchor Diane Sawyer, is one of only 12 people to win an Oscar, Grammy, Emmy and Tony Award. Band Aid 30 was recorded by stars, including One Direction, Ed Sheeran and Eddie Goulding, but there was no Adele. Bob Geldof denied the singer was being snubbed. It's a complete nonsense, all this, and it, you know, who cares? Who cares who doesn't do it or doesn't want to complete their prerogative? A day after Bono laid down his lines for Band Aid, he was involved in a cycling accident in New York's Central Park. He underwent surgery for fractured bones in his face, arm and shoulder. Motown singer Jimmy Ruffin, best known for his hit song What Becomes of the Broken Hearted, has died aged 78 following a short illness. Mylene Class took on Ed Miliband in a TV debate over the mansion tax, arguing it would hit little grannies. And S Club 7 announced they were reforming for a UK tour following an appearance on Children in Need. Now, the crime novelist Patricia Cornwell is one of the world's best-selling and most revered authors. Her most famous character is, of course, forensic sleuth Dr. Kay Scarpetta. She's been solving murders and gripping readers for more than 20 years. And with more than 100 million books sold and a 20-second novel in the series just released, she's showing no signs of slowing down. Delighted to say Patricia Cornwell is here with me now. Great to see you. Great to see you. For Kate Scarpetta, the 20 second novel, what is the enduring interest for you primarily in keeping this character alive? 
Well, I think a lot of it is the way her mind works because she is so skilled in forensic science and medicine and just in the deductive abilities that really go back to Sherlock Holmes, you know, using your mind to figure things out, um, that it just makes it fun to work with her. I don't get bored because it's, it's never a straightforward case. It's always her interpretation of something that's going to be unique. I wonder what your take is on, on the television uptake of this, because, I mean, forensic science mm -hmm. now in terms of crime drama is very, very big business. A lot of people say things like CSI really bounced off the back of these novels. Well, what Scarpetta did, the, the Scarpetta series, which came out in January of 1990, that's how long ago, is it really made forensics um, accessible to the entertainment industry. If you didn't know, if you didn't really go in and embed yourself in, in a building of laboratories and autopsy rooms, you wouldn't realize how you can translate it into to something that will entertain people because otherwise it's very austere and very difficult to understand. And so she translated. She was the Rosetta Stone that translated all these mysteries into something that is now extremely popular on television and movies and also in, in other books. Is it fair to say that, that part of your fascination with this character is the sense that you have a lot in common. There's obviously quite a lot of you in the character, or perhaps the character in you. I don't know. Well, maybe a little of both, but what we most, what, the most important thing that we have in common that makes these books possible is the way our mind works. And I tend to look at things, and it's my nature to dissect them and try to figure everything out. I do it with people, I do it with events. It's just, it's not even conscious on my part. And it's interesting because my father was an appellate specialist. He was the lawyer's lawyer where he dissected the law and he was extremely gifted at it. And so I think genetically I come by this from his side of the family. I, I've heard from authors before the idea that, that a, a character like Kay, when you've, when you've got a really strong character, so someone like Rebus for example, that they really have a life of their own, that you're not really in control of them, they control their own destiny in the books. Is that something you feel? I do, and that's well put. And I, I think they're like children, that you have, a, you do have a lot of say-so over how they live and how they dress and maybe even what they eat, but they need to be their own individuals. And if you try to over-control characters, you'll squeeze the life out of them just like you will with anything else. And Scarpetta is, to, to uh, play off my own title, she is flesh and blood. I mean, she is alive and well and an individual in terms of how I imagine her. She isn't just some reflection of myself. You've got a very int strong interest in East London and Jack the Ripper and the, the history and the mystery behind all of that. Where does that all spring from in you? It's again trying to figure something out that was presented to me in 2001 when somebody was telling me about the case and I started asking about the suspects and then I said, has anyone ever used science, real science? And no one had. So I said, let me have a crack at it. It is without a doubt the most interesting criminal case, unsolved one in the history of of crime and it and it never that will always be true I believe so what well, you think we'll we'll never get to the bottom of it well I believe I'm at the bottom of it I do believe I know you know that who Jack the Ripper was I do believe it was Walter Sickert and I think when people see the remake I make a very compelling case for that more so than than ever but we're still not gonna really be convinced because we can't place him at the crime scene and by now the mystery of Jack the Ripper the legend is far bigger than the cases themselves it's an interesting juxtaposition though your, your view on that is it in the sense that we will never have that proof and yet obviously when you look at Scarpetta about forensics that, that's all about getting the proof. Isn't well it? if you could put her back at those crime scenes <laughs> oh would we solve those cases just like that but they weren't doing that back then they didn't no. know you could do work like that with crime scenes in the Victorian era. What is your take on the industry the publishing industry as a whole now because obviously things have changed an awful lot with the with the e-books and with the, the Amazon take on the market is it still an industry you're happy with? Do you think it's, it's still surviving and heading in the right direction? Oh, it will survive. I, I'm not going to say I'm happy with it because ever since I started there were, there were so many squabbles going on between various publishing entities. It's, and now we're dealing with, with technology which has radicalized things the same way the Gutenberg printing press did. If you go back, you know, even to Dickens, um, since you have all the greatest writers coming from right here, <laughs> I mean, he was squabbling about a lot of the same things that we fight about today if you read about what was going on in the 1840s and 50s with him. But we need storytelling and we need words, and I don't believe that's ever going to go away. I hope not. Patricia Cornwell, it is a joy to talk to you. Thank, Thank you. you very much indeed. Now, the Russian punk band Pussy Riot gained notoriety when they were imprisoned for staging a demonstration in a Moscow cathedral. And two of the collective's members raised eyebrows yet again this week 
when they visited London and held a meeting with an unlikely ally, the WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange. Hind Hassan went to meet them. There is some flash photography in her report. They walked out of the door Julian Assange cannot leave. It was an unexpected visit by two members of Pussy Riot, one that was motivated, they say, by shared beliefs. We have more common that uh, than we expected. What is that? What do you have in common with him? I think it's basic universal things about freedom of expression, if we're talking about us, and uh, freedom of uh, information, if we're talking about him. Nadia and Masha, along with the rest of the feminist rock group, captured the world's attention after they were arrested for performing an anti-Putin song in a church. The world watched as they were paraded in a Russian court from behind a cage. At the time, Julian Assange said that there was unity between their oppression. He'd been granted asylum at the Ecuadorian embassy so as to avoid extradition to Sweden. The WikiLeaks founder insists that allegations of sexual assault are part of a conspiracy to punish him for leaking classified government documents. The band members, on the other hand, are battling the Russian government. When asked their thoughts on President Putin's early exit from the G20 summit, they didn't hold back. We think that uh, Putin's behaviour at, at the end of the G20 summit was very performative, and we believe that uh, world leaders like Putin are somehow uh, taking this performative strategy that Pussy Riot championed some time ago. But that wasn't all they had to say about the Russian leader. Do you believe Putin when he says that Russia has nothing to do with the current situation in Ukraine? Come on, Putin, <laughs> I Putin mean, lies unbelief. every minute. <laughs> so we don't believe and you shouldn't. Thanks. Nadia and Masha say that they and Julian Assange differed on some topics, mainly political tactics, Yet the biggest difference remains that these two are free to walk away. Hind Hassan, Sky News. Well, still to come on the show, Hunger Games stars Josh Hutchison and Liam Hensworth on the end of an era. Now he's collaborated with some of the biggest names in pop, from Ed Sheeran to Cheryl. But with the number one single and over a million records sold, Wretch 3-2 is a star in his own right. Now, earlier this week, he came into the studio to speak to Lucy about his new single and why British urban music gets a bad rap. I can't sing, but I wrote you a song, yeah. Wrong, you a song, yeah. Wrong notes, but the melody's so clear. The melody's so clear. When I'm lost, I'm still close to gold, cos I found my treasure in you. Wretch, lovely to see you. Now, your new single shows a slightly softer side than we're used to. Is this, um, is this a permanent shift for you? Um, do you know what? I, I, I like surprising people. And um, I definitely surprised myself and surpassed what I thought I could deliver in the studio. So, um, you know, to, to come out of the studio with this record and present it to the world and everyone be surprised, I'm happy. Is it a permanent fixture? Mm -hmm. um, Nobody knows. Unless I go in the, when I go in the studio, that's when I feel the vibe and I make what I feel I need to create on the day. You said that you surprised even yourself. Why? Yeah. I can't sing, but I can <laughs> glide. So, um, you know, just recording it, the process is extremely different from rapping. And, um, you know, layering your vocal and getting layers around me and stuff. So I learned so much on the day. You've recently tweeted saying that rap, about rap, saying our genre will be on radio and TV the least, so we have to shout about it the most. Yeah. I mean, why do you think that is? Why don't we hear more rappers on um, British radio and TV? Because in America it's very different, yeah, yeah, isn't yeah, yeah. it? Yeah, I think just the, the demographic's different here, and I don't think it is the popular genre. Do you know what I mean? And um, I think the, the, the records that the radio or the television represent our popular music or the most popular music even though rap is popular but we haven't fit we haven't fitted in that bracket as yet and i just think that um i don't think it's necessarily a bad thing maybe we're supposed to be a niche but we are always supposed to you know outplay our airplay or outdo our our, our tv representation possibly so yeah and rap sometimes has quite a bad reputation. I mean, people mm -hmm. flag up the bad language in it. Is that something that annoys you? It is sort of seen as, um, you know, reflecting all the bad in youth culture at times, all the evils yeah. in youth culture. Yeah, it's quite frustrating at times because, you know, a record like Six Words, I'm a rapper. 
like one of the biggest rappers in the country, but I've made a record like six words talking about my two children. You know, but if I ever have a negative line, it, it could be spoken about more than this record, so yeah. Yeah, and used against you and other rappers. Yeah, and... which is it's not fair. You know, everybody has has days and you have to understand that rap music we're 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 reflecting and we're mirroring what we see or what we've been through or the struggle. That's what that's what it's that's kind of what it's about. That's what it's been built off. You know, like I haven't got this, but I see myself getting to here, mm. and you kind of wrap your way to that position. Um, you work with a youth charity, um, Find a Future, which is a, yeah, I believe yeah, yeah. a charity that works with young people trying to unlock their potential. And how and why did you get involved with them? I love stuff like that because as a kid, um, there wasn't as many opportunities that were open to me, and um, I feel like being in this position, if I can use any type of light or anything I get to shine back onto the, the future, you know, and the next generation. And what I liked about the charity was it, it allows the kids to be very hands-on. So when I go down to the workshops, they're able to come in and they say, OK, I like to rap. OK, cool, here's a studio. We're going we're gonna to allow you to perform today. Another kid might come in and say, I feel like I can construct or, or um, I, I like building houses and building things. OK, cool. We have, you know, we have stuff that you can actually be hands-on and build. And I think... That's the best way because, you know, uh, when, you're, when you're explaining to a child in, in hindsight like this happens, that happens, it's quite boring. Mm -hmm. You know, kids, they like to be hands-on, they like to try it, and then they're like, you know what, I absolutely hate that, so I'm going to go and try this. And, you know, we have the option of them doing that. So it's nice for you, presumably, to be able to put something back. Yeah, 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 a million percent. I love it, I love it. If I, if I had my way, you know, I'd have, like, I want a performing art school and stuff like that. That's where I see myself going, man. And when is the album out? The album will come out early next year. Fantastic. Thank you so much. It's lovely Thank to have you. met you. Pleasure. Thank you. Now it's time to see what's on at the cinema this weekend. And the big release is the penultimate film in the Hunger Games series. You're all from the Capitol? Plutarch got you out? Don't expect much chit-chat from him. Capitol cut his tongue out years ago. And no, it wasn't any sort of rescue, if that's what you mean. We all fled on our own. For this. For you. Well, the very own Joe McAlchuk is here. Look, does it live up to the hype, Joe? That's the big question. Well, it, it kind of does, but I think it falls into that trap, doesn't it? The fact that this is part one of one book, the same as Twilight and Harry Potter. And it does feel like it's kind of trying to eat the story out a little bit uh, too much. It's easy to be cynical, isn't it? You could say that, you know, two films means double the money. But I think it just about gets away with it here. Just how smart it is, you kind of think, I'll go with it. But there's still, you're never wholly satisfied because you know sort of the best bits are still to come in the second part. And I think unless you're a steadfast Hunger Games fan, you're still going to come away a little bit unsatisfied. Mm. Uh, by it, but Jennifer Lawrence carries it in many respects. I mean, you've got cinema's most bankable leading lady there, haven't you, with uh, Jennifer Lawrence? But it's been such a big franchise for the stars of this. The fact that this is the penultimate movie, and presumably they've they've shot both parts. Already, yeah, they filmed they? together. Yeah. So it's the end of an era for them. It is the end of the era for them. And uh, you know, when I went and spoke to him, I think there's a tinge of sadness there. They're not sort of crying before bedtime just yet because they've got to go through the press all over again this time next year. I won't want to give the ending away of this movie, but when I spoke to Josh Hutcherson, he doesn't have as much to do in this film, and he was quite sad about that. I knew, like, in Mockingjay 1, um, I'm captured in the capital for a lot of it, and, and so I'm not really, wasn't really part of the filming a lot for, the, for that first film, and, and that was sad, man, like, to be at home knowing that these, my, <coughs> my best friends were out making this movie, and I was yeah. stuck in my own bed with my dog, which was nice, <laughs> <laughs> which was nice, but... It sounds awful. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was looking forward to Mockingjay, and that's kind of the moment when PETA really games. turns, and, and, you know, he goes from being this guy that everybody knows him as, and, and, and gets tortured and brainwashed, so his kind of descent into that was something I was really excited to sort of take on. Do you take any notice of reviews? I don't. I, I don't read any no. reviews or pictures or... No, because no, I mean, if you start doing that, you, you can read a hundred good ones and one bad one, and you're only yeah. going to remember the bad one. Totally. Totally. So there's no point. Yeah, yeah. This is all over for you. You've, you've finished filming, haven't you? I mean, it's just weird coming back to sort of talking about this. I have really nothing else to live for. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done, <laughs> done, man. In your bed every day. Game with over, man. Getting sick. <laughs> the tears aren't welling up just yet, but this time next year. I cry every night. Yeah. I cry every single night yeah. and sometimes mornings as well. <laughs> Double cry. Yeah. And yet your dog's wondering what the hell's going on with you. Yeah. Exactly. Weeping into yeah, your, totally. your pillow every night. Yeah, he gets it. 
I cry every night, Steve, when I know I have to interview Liam Hemsworth. He doesn't say too much in these junket situations, but Josh was very chatty then. Yeah, at least one was chatty. Look, whether it's a good film or a bad film, people are going to see it. It's going to make a hell of a lot of money regardless, yeah. yeah. Um, one trailer I saw the other day and thought, wow, I've got to go and see this, is Get On Up. Yeah. The James Brown story. Fantastic trailer, rags to riches trailer, great music scenes, but actually it's quite a weird film. It has this sort of bizarre narrative structure where it hops between decades and you don't quite know where you are with it. And every so often Chadwick Boseman, who's the star, plays James Brown, he breaks the fourth wall. He sort of looked down the lens and addressed the audience directly. <laughs> and for some people it will frustrate them, mm. I think, because of that. I mean, I think the aim is to demonstrate James Brown's sort of slightly chaotic life, but you never get under the skin of him. Wow. in it, in the same way you did with Jamie Foxx and Ray or Joaquin Phoenix in Walk the Line. So it doesn't quite match those great musical biopics, even Jersey Boys this summer, which was uh, a great film. I'll tell you what, let's tempt okay. ourselves with a little preview. I ain't you sugar, I ain't your baby. Not then, not now. And I don't want you to tell nobody you my mama. It's me and you know that ain't true. Well, I ain't never want to be no mama. But you were inside of me. I carried you. I had you, so I chose you. You've got to say, it's that he's got the look and the voice and the express. I mean, it's there. To me, oh, it's, he, it, it's spot on. He binds the whole movie together, and yeah, he's got the sort of the moves there. I mean, if he was in Strictly this weekend, he'd be getting tens across the board. <laughs> uh, it's a fantastic performance from him uh, in, in, in the role. I think he, if he's not among the Oscar contenders next year, I think it'd be an absolute tragedy. His physical performance is so good, they actually dubbed James Brown's vocals over the top of this, you know, so it is like watching a great concert movie. Wow. But I think that the narrative and the time hopping might frustrate some people. If you go with it and, you know, it's great, but it's two and a half hours long. If, you, if it doesn't quite sit well with you, you might, be, you might be a bit confused. OK, quite how you go from James Brown to Paddington Bear, I don't know, but he's been all over the news You've just done it, Steve. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but all over the news over there. because Probably there's all this confusion something. over the rating. Mary. Yeah, it was, um, well, it's been given a PG because the uh, BBFC said it had mild sex references and mild nudity. As you can see there, Paddington Bear doesn't have his duffel coat on just yet, so no. I don't know if that's going to shock some people. Uh, I mean, there was a bit of a fury over this, and they've now downgraded it, saying it's innuendo. They were worried about mild sex references where Hugh Bonneville's character dresses up as a woman. That was obviously going to shock impressionable four-year-olds. So is it a you now, then? It's still a PG. Oh, because so it's still a PG. It's got dangerous behaviour, mild threats, innuendo, and infrequent mild bad language. Oh, well. Still well, a PG. That'll encourage a few more adults to go <laughs> and see it. I think mean, it looks fantastic. And are you going to be giving it a full review next yeah. week, aren't you? Definitely. So we look forward to that. Joe, thanks very much indeed. Well, that's all for now, but on next week's show, we talk to Ronan Keating about trading Boyzone for treading the boards in the musical Once. The real-life British soldiers whose ordeal in Afghanistan inspired a new film. And Angelina Jolie steps behind the camera to direct her latest movie, Unbroken.